Hey, what's up Seekers, welcome back. In today's class, we're going to be asking, what was the relationship between Maimonides and Kabbalah? Did he accept it or reject it? Did he know about it at all? And what was the Kabbalist take on him? Did they accept him? Did they reject him? Did they know about him at all? Were they influenced by him? Was he influenced by them? Was he perhaps himself a secret Kabbalist? Or was he their secret antagonist? As all aficionados of messy theological histories might suspect, the answer to these either-or questions might just be in fact, well, both, actually. Let us get to the bottom of this love-hate relationship between Maimonides and Kabbalah in part 3 of this series on Maimonides and Mysticism. It is my great honor, privilege, and pleasure to inform you that this video and this series is being produced in collaboration with two brilliant friends of mine, the philosophers and educators Dr. Justin Sledge from the channel Esoterica and Philip Holm from the channel Let's Talk Religion. It is a tremendous delight to be creating content alongside such kind, caring, thoughtful, and intelligent people. If you do not know their channels already, please go over quickly and subscribe to them before wasting another minute. Philip's video is going to be looking at the son of Maimonides, Avram ben Arambam, Abraham Maimonides, and the tradition of Sufi-influenced Jewish pietism in Egypt in the 13th century. That is a fascinating subject, and Philip has done a brilliant job presenting it. Do check out that video of his. Justin is going to be exploring Maimonides at the crossroads of philosophy and the occult, as he does best. Justin will be looking at the pivotal role which Maimonides plays in the history of Jewish mysticism. Check out Justin's video on that fantastic subject. And once again, if you do not know these scholars' brilliant works, their libraries of content, and their engaging communities where they're exploring the subjects of religion, history, philosophy, esotericism, and mysticism, do check out their work. And thank you guys for your kindness, for your friendship, mentorship, and your faith in me and my project. If you're into Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, universal mysticism, comparative mysticism, philosophical mysticism, you're in the right place. Check out the rest of our content here at the channel and make sure to subscribe and share it with a friend. Much love. With no further ado, here's the class. It may be difficult to imagine, given just how accepted Maimonides has become in contemporary Judaism, but in the centuries following Maimonides' passing, and flaring up over the course of Jewish history, there erupted a severe rejection of Maimonides, directed both towards his legal halachic work, but even more so towards his theological and philosophical work, culminating in the banning and eventual burning of Maimonides' Moronavuchim, his guide for the perplexed, and the opening chapters of his legal work, Mishneh Torah. We touched upon this saga in our first introductory class on Maimonides, this war waged primarily by the rabbis of France against Maimonides, their collusion with the Dominican Inquisition, and the disastrous results it brought about. We don't intend to return to this debacle, the Maimonidean controversy as it's been called, because there's been enough good scholarship produced on it, and we'd rather spend our precious time here seeking unity rather than chasing controversy. I only bring it up again to provide some context for our current subject of focus, Maimonides and Kabbalah. Because among the ranks of the leading rabbis of the anti-Maimonidean camp, who denounce Maimonides' great works as either highly problematic to say the least or outright heretical, we find many important Kabbalists. Kabbalists like Nachmanides and Rekinati, for example, argued against Maimonides' introduction of foreign Greek thought into Judaism, a central and recurring accusation of the anti-Maimonidean camp. The rivaled Abraham ben David of Provence objected to Maimonides' declaration of heretic on anyone who possessed a belief in divine corporeality, the belief that associates bodiliness with God, arguing that many greater and wiser than he seemed to have embraced such position, and who was he to call them heretics? And the Tosafist Moshe ben Chazdai of Tarku, in his Kitav Tamim, found Maimonides' theological innovations to be so radical and divergent from Judaism that he accused Maimonides of proposing a new religion entirely. The most vociferous rejection of Maimonides from amongst the Kabbalists, however, came from the pens of Meir ibn Gabay and Harshiyat from Shemtev ibn Shemtev the former in his Avodat HaKodesh, and the latter in his Sefer HaEmunot. Check those out if you want to see some really scathing reviews. The general feeling among the early Kabbalists was that Maimonides' naturalism and rationalism was in direct contradiction not only with Kabbalah, but with Judaism as a whole. In their view, Kabbalah was the authentic representation of the unbroken ancient tradition of Judaism, while Maimonides represented a foreign infiltration which had nothing to do with the God of Abraham. Besides for his general theology, theories of creation, revelation, and providence, which the Kabbalists found to be closer to those preached by Aristotle than by Moses, 
The main points of contention which set the Theosophical Kabbalist against Maimonides, to be a bit more specific, was his rejection of certain strands of Jewish mysticism, his stance on the secrets of the Torah, especially those known as Maaseh Merkava and Maaseh Bereshit, and his stance on the reasons behind the commandments, the Ta'ameh HaMetzvot as they're known in Hebrew. To spell out these three points in a bit more detail. Number one, Maimonides openly rejected the Shir Koima literature of the Heichalot library, an important early form and body of texts of Jewish mysticism, rejecting them as spurious forgeries. Making Maimonides the first significant Jewish theological authority, in Moshe Yidel's opinion, who dared oppose these ancient forms of Jewish mysticism. The second reason for the Kabbalist rejection was because Maimonides had written that the Talmudic mystical traditions of Masse Bereshit, the mystics' reading of the Genesis creation narrative and Masse Merkava, their reading of the Revelation narrative from the prophet Ezekiel, had been lost hundreds of years earlier during the Taneitic periods of the Talmud, effectively discrediting any Jewish mystical tradition which followed, including the Jewish mystics of his day, and instead proposed his own readings of these two accounts, which, insofar as the Kabbalists were concerned, amounted to nothing more than a re-reading of their sacred Masse Bereshit, the works of creation as Aristotelian physics, and of Masse Merkava, the workings of the Divine Chariot, as mere Aristotelian metaphysics. For the Kabbalists, this was high heresy. The deepest secrets of Judaism, the inner soul and mysteries of the Torah, Masse Bereshit, the account of the intra-divine cosmogenic process in Edel's language, the depiction of the process of the creation of the cosmos that takes place within God, and Masse Merkava, the workings of the divine cosmic chariot, perhaps the central mystical meditation of the aspiring initiate who would meditate on this corpus of divine literature, explicating and exemplifying, investigating and imitating the prophetic experience of the divine chariot of God as recounted by the prophet Ezekiel. Both of these immense bodies of mystical thought experience and practice were reduced to mere science and philosophy, to Greek physics and metaphysics, an abomination if there ever was one. Ibn Shemtiv, who we mentioned earlier, was so repulsed by these suggestions that he writes, heaven forbid that one should understand it this way. And Mayor Ibn Abay tells us that Maimonides was led to interpreting the secret of the Torah rationally because he was naked, ignorant of the true tradition, and because he had strayed into foreign knowledge the enemy of Sarah. Had he only been aware of the truth of Judaism, he would have retracted, redacted, and repented. Harsh words for a man like Maimonides. As we can see, he's not really getting off to a great start amongst the Kabbalists. The second area of Maimonidean scholarship which enraged the Kabbalists and other traditional proponents of the rabbinic establishment was Maimonides' interpretation of the reasons behind the biblical commandments, the Tamei HaMitzvot, the reasons for the mitzvot as they're known in Hebrew. The Kabbalists saw Maimonides as arguing that all the commandments could be explained historically and rationally as ways to behaviorally condition the practitioner to instill ethics and correct opinions. The commandments served a social, ethical, or even religious end, but had no intrinsic spiritual value in and of themselves. Whereas for the Kabbalists, nothing could be further from the truth. For them, the commandments were seen not as mere allegories or pedagogical tools, but were instead seen as a secret rite and ritual. To perform them was to engage with mysteries of cosmic significance. The commandments not only created holiness for the human, but had a theurgical impact on the divine realm, with each commandment corresponding to specific spiritual entities upon which it made its healing mark. The commandments were the active ingredients in a complex theosophical system with ramifications in these spherotic worlds, and they were the avenues by which the human could unite the divine masculine with the divine feminine, could shabricho with his shechina, and in doing so, identifying with the shechina, could unite and cleave to God. It would be hard to imagine how these two readings of the commandments, the Maimonidean and the Kabbalistic, could be any further apart from one another. Nachmanides, Moses ben Nachman, the Ramban, a younger contemporary of Maimonides and an influential Kabbalist and scholar in his own right, often depicted as Maimonides' mystical counterpart, picks up where Maimonides left off in his project of explaining the rationales behind the commandments, but argues that Maimonides missed the mark because the commandments can only be understood with the knowledge of the Kabbalistic system, writing, no person is capable of comprehending the nature of the commandments by the power of their own reason, but only through the Kabbalistic tradition, which is received from the mouth of one who received it, all the way back to the mouth of Moses, who received it from the mouth of God. The tradition and reception of which he insinuates, Maimonides was not privy to, but to which he, Nachmanides, was. Maimonides' rationales, 
particularly when it came to explaining the extensive biblical instructions regarding the sacrifices in the temple, were so difficult for his contemporaries to swallow that even his most outspoken defenders, someone like the Rivard, was forced to say that Maimonides had not spoken his true belief and opinion when it came to these subjects, but it only provided the rationales he had to, quote, answer the unbelievers. When even his own defenders have to back down to such a position, you know things were pretty bad. The Kabbalist accusation that Maimonides simply wasn't privy to the secret tradition of Judaism was a radical thing to say of a figure of his magnitude, who would go on to shape the tradition like few others in Jewish history. But in some ways, the Kabbalists were forced to take this position and were simply concurring with the judgment Maimonides had made for himself. Allow me to explain. When Maimonides rejected the Shirkoima, Mysiberatius, and Mysimirkava, he did so because he believed that any authentic line of transmission of these esoteric mysteries of Judaism, which by design had to be passed down in secrecy from master to disciple, had been long lost and broken. We have no Masora, no tradition in our hands, writes Maimonides. These were devastating words for those who believed themselves to be the rightful heirs and recipients of these ancient, unbroken mystical traditions. They believed that they did have the Masora, the tradition, in their own hands. Maimonides added insult to injury by audaciously concluding that he himself was forced to reconstruct the lost traditions of Masa Bereshit and Masa Merkava from scratch, and no less from the metaphysics of Plato and Aristotle, Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina. The Kabbalists, as we began mentioning earlier, could not stand by silently while Maimonides, not only the great philosopher, but also the great rabbi and halachist, not only laid waste to the legitimacy of their tradition, but also worked to replace it with what was in their view a pagan philosophical system from Athens, the enemy of Jerusalem. In Idel's opinion, it was this crisis, precipitated precisely because Maimonides' stature and magnitude, that forced the Kabbalists to come out from underground, from their esoteric caves of secrecy, and for the first time publicly espouse, publish, and defend their tradition. In Idel's words, Maimonides' systematic works, which implied that Jewish esoteric traditions were lost, and that he rediscovered them in the form of his rationalistic construction, forced the Kabbalists to crystallize the pieces of esoteric traditions found in their hands, and to formulate them into a comprehensive system, effectively making Maimonides a principal catalyst for the crystallization of early Kabbalah. The irony being that the writings of Maimonides contributed to structuring modes of religious thought that he did his best to combat. But history is far from single and monoscopic. A fascinating exception to the less than favorable reception that Maimonides received from the early Kabbalists, which we've laid out up until now, can be found in the enigmatic figure of Abraham Abulafia. To nuance the story we've been telling thus far, during the 13th century, there were a total of seven commentaries written on Maimonides' Guide to the Perplexed, five out of the seven were written by Kabbalists, and three out of those five were written by Abraham Abulafia, the most commentaries written on Maimonides' Guide by any single individual, outdoing even Maimonides' self-professed rationalistic students and successors. Maimonides' Guide seems to have after all found some place in the early 13th century Kabbalists. So who was this Abraham Abulafia? Abraham Abulafia, a philosopher turned mystic, had been deeply influenced by the philosophy of the guide, studying it and teaching it all his life. The genius of Abulafia can be seen in his attempt to unite and synthesize what others have and continue to perceive as diametrically opposed into a single systematic structure to serve what he considered nothing but the highest of human ends, the culmination of human perfection in its uniting with the divine. Abulafia takes Maimonides' particular form of Aristotelianism and his allegorical reading of the biblical text, and ingeniously combines it with the linguistic mysticism of the Sefer Yetzirah, with its esoteric knowledge of the divine name, filtered through with elements of Sufism, Ashkenazi mysticism, plus body movements, breathing exercises, fasting, letter permutations, and mantras, all in the attempt of receiving illumination from and uniting with the active intellect, we'll explain more what that is soon, effectively reading Maimonides' guide as a Kabbalistic text, filled with esoteric secrets, 36 in total to be precise, and because it was a secret text, not only could it be read by the Kabbalists for their own ends, but according to Abulafia, it was only the Kabbalists who was truly capable of reading the text correctly. And although philosophers and scholars may cringe just hearing this, no one who understands Abulafia's lifelong engagement with the text can suggest that his reading was not a serious one, even if they ultimately must reject it. 
Ablafia saw his reading of the guide as taking flight from where it, the guide itself, had left off. If the guide took the reader from the literal to the allegorical, Ablafia, with the help of the guide, wanted to take them from the allegorical to the mystical, just as the guide, with the tools of philosophy, hoped to train its reader of a vulgar understanding of religion to one of correct understanding, Abulafia wished to take them one step further, from mere correct understanding to an actual experience of their religion, a mystical experience of ecstasy, union, and possibly even redemption. And in this way, Abulafia's commentaries and readings of the guide had done to it what Maimonides with the guide had done to the Bible and to Jewish tradition before him. And it is through Abulafia's commentaries, teachings, and engagement with the text that Maimonides would go on to have a lasting and significant influence on prophetic and ecstatic Kabbalists for centuries. According to Edel, the two primary contributions Maimonidean thought had on the ecstatic Kabbalists was firstly Maimonides' general metaphysics and secondly his psychological explanation of the phenomena of prophecy. For the first, and if this doesn't make sense to you right now, don't worry, I promise by the end it will, maybe. For the first, Abulafia adopts Maimonides' definition of God as the knower, the knowing, and the known, and frames his own descriptions of union with God as the complete fusion of the human intellect with the divine intellect, unmistakably employing the Maimonidean Aristotelian terminology of the epistemic cognitive union between the knower and the known to describe his own union mystica, his mystical union with God. And the second contribution Maimonides makes to these particular Kabbalists is his elaborate theological and psychological system to explain the phenomena of prophecy, which we will unpack later in the series, supplying the Kabbalists with a psychological schema to legitimize their own inner experiences, empowering the mystic to understand themselves and to interpret their mystical experiences as bona fide prophetic experiences. These prophetic, ecstatic Kabbalists take on the full backing of Maimonides' robust psychology, epistemology, and metaphysics of prophetic illumination, which we will explore and unpack shortly for ourselves as we continue to learn about Maimonides. It is in these two primary ways that in Adele's estimation, Maimonides contributed decisively to the formulation of central elements in Jewish mysticism. And it's here that we begin to see, as we mentioned in the earlier class, Maimonides not only as a negative catalyst, who spurred on the theosophical, theurgical Kabbalists as they're known to mobilize in their collective rejection of him, but also as a positive catalyst for the more ecstatic prophetic Kabbalists seeing Maimonides as one of their own, namely as a Kabbalist who used the tools of philosophy for a higher purpose. History certainly has no shortage of irony. For the former Kabbalists, the more one understood the guide, the more they understood how dangerous and pernicious it was, whereas for the latter, the better the guide was understood, the more clearly its true, namely Kabbalistic, nature became. If for Ibn Shemtiv, the secret hiding behind the philosophical veneer of the guide it was heresy, for Abulafia it was the mystical secrets of the Torah. You know what they say, one man's heresy, another man's mysticism. For Abulafia, what was hiding behind the philosophy were the secrets of the Torah and Kabbalah. In some more recent scholarship, Elliot Wolfson goes even further than Edel, arguing for Maimonides' positive influence not only on the ecstatic Kabbalists but also on the theosophical Kabbalists, particularly in the realms of his negative theology, his hermeneutics of exotericism and esotericism, and in the ideal of dveikut, cleaving or clinging to the divine, as a development for Maimonides' phenomenology of prophecy. I hope to unpack and explore Wolfson's scholarship in an upcoming class in the series. Stay tuned. Coming back to our storyline. However, tracing the historical line a little further down to the Kabbalists of the 16th century, the heyday and renaissance of Jewish mysticism, we find again a mixed reception of Maimonides. The master encyclopedic Kabbalist, the Ramak, Rabbi Moses Cordovero, writes of Maimonides, amongst other Jewish philosophers, that all that has been written by those who pursue the knowledge of God through human reasoning is correct in negating from God's being the attributes and actions and accepts Maimonides' stance on the unity of the knower, the knowing, and the known, more on both of those topics soon. However, we learn from another important Kabbalist, Chaim Vital, the student of the great Isaac Luria the Arizal, the lion, as he was known, that Maimonides' soul has its roots in the left curl, the side of severity, and this is why he was denied knowing the wisdom of the Zohar, the left in Kabbalah being associated with the dark side, whereas Nachmanides was from the right curl, from the side of a grace, and therefore was privy to this wisdom. 
continuing the trope we saw earlier amongst the Kabbalists about those who were privy versus those who were not privy to the secret tradition. In case Maimonides' legacy and reception amongst the Kabbalists isn't weird enough, it might just be worth mentioning a popular legend that the great rationalist Maimonides in his frail final days came finally to see the light and the truth of Kabbalah and secretly converted over to the fun side. The first time we find this tale is in a commentary on Maimonides' Mishnah Torah called Migdal Oz from the 14th century, penned by Shemtev ibn Gon, where he writes that he himself had seen a parchment signed by Maimonides attesting to this change of mind and to his conversion. I'll put up his words here on the screen if you'd like to read them. Meir Ibn Abay, a previous critic of Maimonides that we spoke about earlier, writes as well about Maimonides' conversion legend, writing that once he had found the pearl, he threw away the pebbles. Once he found Kabbalah, he threw away philosophy. And gives us the whole backstory of a certain Rabbi Yaakov who went to Egypt with the express purpose of teaching Maimonides Kabbalah. Maimonides was apparently overjoyed with these teachings and taught them to his students, but unfortunately had already finished composing all his great works and didn't have the opportunity to recall and correct them. Ibn Gabay goes on to quote Isaac of Arbanel, who reports the same story in his Nachalavot, adding to the mouth of the converted sage, were it not towards the end of my life, when my works had already been published throughout the world, I would have retracted many of the things I had written therein. And this story goes on to be repeated and quoted with varying differences and additions by a host of Kabbalists, including Moshe Alashgar, Yosef Ergas, Yosef Shlomo del Megiddo, the Yasher of Candia, who quotes all the previous sources and finds them to be conclusive evidence that Maimonides did indeed become a Kabbalist in his old age and retract his former philosophical opinions. Take this story as you may, but no contemporary scholars find it that compelling. If you can read Hebrew, check out Gershon Shalom's essay, Mechaykir Mekubal, where he tells over the story of this conversion legend in great detail. Among the spiritual heirs of the Kabbalist, the 18th century masters of the Hasidic movement, Maimonides again did not cease to be a controversial figure, continuing to divide opinion wherever he went, with leading Hasidic thinkers taking radically different positions with regards to him. The most negative being that of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, who took a harsh and outspoken position against philosophy in general and Maimonides in specific, and on the other side of things, the most positive reception being by Rabbi Shner Zaman of Liadi, the founder of the Chabad Hasidic dynasty, and his successors, who read Maimonides with his negative theology and love language as a mystic belonging to the spiritual lineage of which they themselves partook. Check out the video coming out from my friend Elisha, where he'll be exploring the relationship between Maimonides and Chabad Hasidot in far greater detail. Maimonides' influence as well continues into the mystical Hasidic movement, with scholars even arguing that one of the central doctrines of Hasidic thought, the idea and practice of Dveikut, cleaving or clinging to God, drew much by way of its formulation from Maimonides' words. Much like their spiritual predecessors, the Kabbalists, in Edel's and Wolfson's estimation, had drawn from the Great Eagle as well, as we discussed earlier. Despite the convenient narratives of Maimonides' late-stage conversion to Kabbalah, the evidence seems rather conclusive insofar as the bulk of his life and writings indicate that Maimonides was no Kabbalist, evident both from what he explicitly rejects and perhaps even more so from what he fails to mention at all. It would seem that the most logical explanation for the sheer absence of any strictly Kabbalistic themes and motifs in his writings is that he just wasn't a Kabbalist. Covert and esoteric readings of his non-Kabbalistic writings, such as those carried out by Abraham Balafia, are great, but also simply unfalsifiable. The confluence of three factors, the interpretive elasticity and nature of literature in general, the malleable adaptiveness of symbols, particularly Kabbalistic ones, and the brilliance of a mind like Abalafia's, leave any text ever written vulnerable to a superbly creative Kabbalistic reading. It seems to me that the Kabbalistic reading of the guide says less, unfortunately, about the guide itself and more about the nature of literature, symbology, and the creativity of the human mind. This is, of course, to say nothing about the very real impact Maimonides' words had upon the Kabbalists and the Hasidic thinkers, of which we've outlined just the very tip of the iceberg in this class, which stands totally independent of whether or not Maimonides was a Kabbalist himself. However, having said all that, while Maimonides may not have been a Kabbalist, he may very well still have been a Jewish mystic, even while being a philosopher and a rationalist. How one might be a Jewish mystic, but not a Kabbalist, while also being a rationalist philosopher, will be, God willing, the subject of next week's class. Thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed and learned something. Thank you to our patrons for supporting this work. If you would like to join them, please do if you can afford it. And until next week, keep seeking.